Welcome to Dynasty Life. I'm Theo Greminger. Redraft ends, but Dynasty is life. And I'm the, at the time of recording this, we are two weeks away from knowing the first round landing spots. We are officially 13 days away from the NFL draft. And I'm really excited to be joined by a friend of mine, Garrett Price of Dynasty Nerds. This is the second time Garrett has been on Dynasty Life. So he obviously did a good job last time. Last time Garrett was in the house, we had a really fun show subject, one that was like a really one where we could sort of galaxy brain it out. And we discussed what we would be willing to trade uh, rookie draft picks for players. And we we had a really you know insightful conversation that I think was very beneficial to a lot of dynasty managers, got a lot of positive feedback. Today, we might get a little bit of hate and negativity because we're doing something that we're talking about sell highs in dynasty. And we're not talking about players that everybody else is talking about on podcasts. Like, we're not going to go out here and say, sell Chuba Hubbard before the NFL draft, sell Zach Moss. We're going to talk about players that are at peak dynasty value that could potentially bring you incredible returns. But before we do that, Garrett, welcome to Dynasty Life. Let everybody know what you have going on. You guys are putting out a ton of great content at Dynasty Nerds. You yourself are grinding right now this time of year. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it is. It is that season. I mean, it, anybody that does dynasty this time of year, there's a lot going on. I, I, all the stuff, the preparation that it takes to get ready for the NFL draft. It, it's a lot. And especially if you're a film guy, uh, you know, analytics guys are awesome. And and they, they live they live the good life because they get to punch things in and then it spits out what they need. Uh, film grinders, it takes us it takes us a while. Uh, we we don't get to go through uh, all the players and all the prospects nearly as quickly. So uh, it, this time of year, it, it's definitely a grind. Uh, but I'm getting the nerd scores ready, which is which is my tape score. Uh, we're getting all of the profiles finished and completed, all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's it's busy, but I love it. It's it's so much fun. Yeah, no, it's definitely awesome. And I have a couple of evergreen questions. And last time you were here, I asked a couple of them. So we're gonna skip like the uh, most disappointing and, you know, the biggest positive surprise. You already gave me that. But I have another question that I usually save for the summer, but I'm starting to ask it now. If you could know the final stats for any single player in fantasy in 2024, who would it be? I think right now for me, it would probably be Tank Dell. Uh, the, this new situation going on with Stefan Diggs there, in uh in houston nico collins is there he's obviously a talented player as well but he's on the last year of his deal it's a one-year deal for stefan diggs but i'm really curious to see how this pecking order really shakes out because i really like tank dell but obviously he's coming off the injury we expect him to be full go uh, but it, it, there's always just those lingering question marks when there's a big situation change coming off injury I would love to know what his stats were because I want to invest like everything into Tank Dell, but I'm still just a little hesitant. Well, I just made a Tank Dell trade yesterday. Okay. I, in a single QB FFPC league, I traded T Higgins and the 305 for Tank Dell and the 301. Essentially, Tank Dell for, for T Higgins. I felt like it yeah. was a reasonable pivot that I couldn't have gotten done six weeks ago. Um, and now it's sort of like a little bit of a buying window. And if I get burned, I don't think T Higgins is the one that's going to, going to kill me, Garrett. He's already kind of shown, a uh, what he is maybe wide receiver two season. I don't think I'm going to lose on like a top five season from T Higgins, but on the flip side, the market could be really reading tank Dell incorrectly because this is a guy that we saw giving us 16, 17 points per game as a rookie has a chemistry with CJ Stroud. And like you said, he's the, the had the least NFL experience and the most contract insulation of the receivers in in Houston. So I, I'll, I'll take a, I'll take on some more Tank Dell. Your thoughts on that trade? I like it. I like that deal. I think you know both those players are in a very very similar range for me right now, and that's you you have to take risks at times uh, in fantasy. And I think Tank Dell is a very reasonable risk right now because of the contract, because of what he did as a rookie, because of his relationship with CJ Stroud, all of those things, while yes, you know, he's still undersized, he proved that that doesn't matter. Uh, so I, 
I think he's one of the more reasonable risks that you can take despite Stefan Diggs being there. I don't anticipate that being a long marriage. So I really like Tank Dell. So I would make that deal. Yeah. And uh, that was one of my questions. So we're, we, 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 you were able to answer two questions at, at once, Garrett. We're going to talk about that Diggs trade. But that. We, we pretty much covered that you're, you're absolutely a pro. And we can both agree this guy's not high profile enough to make this uh, list. But I have concerns about Dalton Schultz sort of returning anything worthwhile next year. I think last year he gave you sort of that. He's had a, 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 a you know hat tip to him. He's had a great fantasy run of of tight end one production, but it feels like the 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 floor could fall out next year. They add Mixon, they add Diggs, Dell and Collins one year older. It seems like Schultz is going to be very touchdown dependent and not a guy we can sort of lean on as like a tight end 12 type. What is your thoughts on Schultz? Yeah, really the tight end position in general, I really view it as the haves and have nots. And basically right now we we have a little more depth at tight end than we've had in a while. Uh, but you have five, six, you know, if you want to put Brock Bowers in there already too, which I think is fair, uh, you know, like seven guys that are really, really good that could all feasibly finish as a top seven tight end. But what we see historically is that tight end, anywhere from tight end five to tight end seven in that range, all the way down to like 16 to 18, negligible in points, like very, very little difference. And so for me, I would rather, if I'm in a startup and I don't get one of those guys, I don't get, Dalton Kincaid. I don't get Sam Laporta. I don't get Mark Andrews. You know, I don't get those top tier guys. I, I'm just going to wait till tight end 18, 19. And so if Schultz is there, cool. If it's, uh, you know, David Njoku's fallen to that range in the past, he won't anymore. Uh, but if it's, uh, let's see who else is around there. If it's Pat Fryermuth, if it's Luke Musgrave, if it's Dallas Goddard, if it's like, I, at that point, I almost don't care because I really think it's just going to be negligible difference between those guys. I think that's a good way of putting it. Just a non-impactful, don't chase the kind of the middle class of tight end. It's either elite or we're waiting and looking for values or youth. I think that's a great way of going about it. We've seen a rookie wide receiver. The, these rookies are coming in and they're incredibly fast-tracked towards success. You know, in the past, we've seen big seasons out of players like Randy Moss as rookies, and you'd see it every few years where a rookie would come in and make a, a substantial impact, uh, Keenan Allen. But when we've gotten over the last few years, it seems like it's being sped up. You have three out of the last four years where we've had a rookie wide receiver finish inside of the top six scorers in PPR at the wide receiver position. Puka Nakua last year, Jamar Chase in 2021, and Justin Jefferson in 2020. I feel like we are going to see a rookie finish as wide receiver one at the wide receiver position sometime soon. Whether it's this year, I don't know. But I think sometime in the near future, someone's going to come in in a perfect situation and just break fantasy. If a wide receiver from this particular class is the one to do it, which player is it, and on which landing spot would it be? Yeah, it's a great question because I think you can make a decent argument for all three of the top three guys. All three of them are pretty freaking fantastic. Uh, so I think you could see it a few different ways. The gut answer for me is if Marvin Harrison Jr. ends up going to Arizona, and Kyler Murray is willing to just target him and feed him like he did DeAndre Hopkins the first year that the two of those guys were together, we could see some elite, elite wide receiver one type stuff. Because, I mean, when you when you talk about play style, they're not too dissimilar between DeAndre Hopkins and, and Marvin Harrison Jr. So uh, now, obviously, slightly different offense than what it was under Kingsbury. Uh, so you have to take that into account. But yeah, I think I think that's the one where I could really potentially see just absolute fireworks from those guys. I love that answer, and I think that it's it's sort of a low hanging fruit. I think the answer has to be Marvin Harrison Jr. because of his touchdown upside, 
And I think for me, it's Marvin Harrison Jr. to the LA Chargers because when it comes to oh, Arizona, sure, yeah. Arizona, we have a little bit more target competition. And, you know, you also have the threat of Kyler Murray a little bit more around the goal line. Marvin Harrison Jr. in LA, I mean, you talk about, we had that season from Mike Williams where through like eight games, he was wide receiver one. That was 2021. And eventually, you know, eventually he got injured like he always does. And Cooper Cup yep. finishes wide receiver one. But we saw that sort of nuclear path for a high touchdown upside guy, a larger wide receiver. Then we've seen Keenan Allen give us multiple strong seasons attached to Herbert, multiple wide receiver one seasons. Now, if Marvin Harrison Jr. ends up in L.A., there is nothing around him. His biggest competition for targets would be Josh Palmer, plus the loss of Austin Eckler. I think that he could, on 150 targets, as the primary read from Justin Herbert, he could have 15 touchdown catches and get enough catches that this guy is wide receiver one overall. I think that's, for me, the nuts landing spot. But it's a really great way of, like, galaxy braining these, these receivers when you're talking about pure optimism and best case scenario. Uh, but yeah, Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to be a lot of fun and we'll know where he's at in 13 days. It's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, we're going to take a quick break. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about some trading strategy. And then we're going to share with you a couple of sell highs that we think can help you that might make you a little bit uncomfortable. Just a warning. If you want to, if you want to log out, this is not going to be your standard sell high dynasty show. We'll be right back. Hey, why do we partner with the FFPC? Because they have the widest variety of fantasy football formats, and it's the easiest place to find all types of fantasy football contests in the world. What if you want to play for high stakes? Well, they have a $6 million prize pool with their Fantasy Players Championship. They also have way too early best ball leagues that start in February and Dynasty Leagues. They have the closest thing to a liquid market for orphans that there is in all of Dynasty. And the FFPC has sponsored us for half a decade because we are actually delivering information that can help fantasy gamers and they're generating so much interest and bringing in so many new users, casual users even. The FFPC creates a unique experience where you can both compete against the best and make money. Use promo code UNDERWORLD to get $25 off your first team. $25 off your first team at the FFPC with promo code UNDERWORLD. Go get it! Welcome back to Dynasty Life. Theo Greminger joined by Garrett Price of Dynasty Nerds. And when we talk about sell highs, we've seen this story sort of a, a million times in, in Dynasty. I can recall a few seasons back, Javante Williams, post-rookie year, we're supposed to get Melvin Gordon leaving as a free agent. Dwayne McFarlane, who's one of the sharpest guys out there, tweets out that Javante Williams is the top five pick in redraft. The dynasty values just skyrocketed. And I recall I ended up selling Javante Williams in a, in a league, a single QB league. I got three first for him. I think I got two current firsts and like oh, a wow. future first. So like this happened. Then you talk about like Kyle Pitts post-rookie season. Kyle Pitts gives you 70 catches, 1,000 yards. He ends up being a, in tight end premium leagues, uh, you know, a top 10 pick, top 12 pick heading into year two. The managers that sold him in Dynasty, you get the eyebrow raise, and it's sort of a, you know, how, how the heck could you sell that guy? You've got the, the perfect Dynasty asset. But a lot of times I think that there's sort of a rule where guys get to a certain peak. If you sell over asking – it doesn't usually burn you. Occasionally, you know, you sell Justin Jefferson after his rookie year or you make a mistake and you sell like an Amon Ross St. Brown thinking he's going to regress to the mean. It can burn you. But maybe most of the time it doesn't. Is there a specific rule for you, Garrett, where you look at a player and, and forget quarterbacks, forget like, let's forget quarterbacks. I think quarterbacks and super flex can throw people off because it's sort of irreplaceable guys like Mahomes. But when you're talking about a non-quarterback, do you have a specific rule where if I offer you three first, are you taking it? Yeah. I, I mean, honestly, for almost any running back situation, if I'm getting three first, I'm at least strongly considering it. Uh, you know, it, it, it depends a little bit on roster construction and, and where I'm at as far as a contender versus a, a rebuild. If I'm getting three first for a running back in almost any situation in a rebuild, I, I'm probably doing the deal. Uh, but it's 
I would, I hesitate to say that I have a hard, fast rule because there are so many little nuances to each situation that make it really tricky to just have a hard, fast rule. But yeah, three firsts. I mean, you're going to be able to get almost any player off my roster outside of probably Justin Jefferson or a quarterback. Yeah, I think it's sort of a, you hate to be like steadfast and and have like set rules in Dynasty because I think you bring up the fact that there's nuance and there's like little differences in and roster specific. But if somebody wants to overpay you that much, the chance of sort of recouping value, especially in Superflex, is there. Um, so that's one that we're, we're going to dive into a little bit more of the theory of the sell high. But the question on a lot of fantasy dynasty fantasy managers right now is, how are you handling the Rashi Rice and Hollywood Brown situation in Kansas City right now? We have, of course, the uh, some legal issues for Rashi Rice, whether that means a two-game suspension, a four-game suspension. Who knows? It seems like we're learning a little bit more new information about this you know every you know every couple of days something trickles out so i personally think that this is going to be like a two game situation but you might have a different idea of that how are you handling this rashi rice is he a buy low for you right now in dynasty uh i wouldn't say he's necessarily a buy low uh he's more of a hold for me at the moment uh the the reason being I'm with you. I don't think he's going to be a super lofty suspension. You know, I don't think we're going to, he's going to be missing an entire season. I don't think, I don't think he's going to be anything that overly impacts your dynasty roster. Uh, so because of that, I'm, I'm not wanting to just quickly just knee jerk sell, get whatever I can and try to recoup that. Like he's a talented young player connected to the best quarterback in one of the best offenses in football. So, to, to just overreact and sell a guy like that, I think it's a little premature. Now, depending on the cost, I'm everyone has a has a price and 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 I'm willing to buy uh rice as well. But I also don't know that I'm willing to pay what I would have had to pay two months ago for rice. Uh partly because I do think I, I like Hollywood Brown a little more than other people do. I do think that he's gonna come in and he's going to be a factor. I also think that we're we're leaving Travis Kelsey for dead. And while for dynasty purposes, I understand why he could retire at any moment. Uh, but, but on the short term, he, he's still going to be a volume hog uh, in this offense. And the, the last part of it is we still just haven't seen anyone come in since Tyree kill and be a consistent fantasy producer outside of Travis Kelsey. And so I don't know that I'm quite willing to pay the price to where Rice got unless I am able to get a, a really good discount. So let's talk about that. What would be a rookie draft pick in this 2024 draft, or if you want to take it to 2025 future picks, that's fine, that you would feel like is, hey, I kind of got to take that that offer for, for Rashi Rice. If you're looking to trade for him let's say somebody the rashi rice manager yeah. makes this offer to you garrett yeah if 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 he were to offer me an early second or sorry he were to want an early second and he was going to give me give me rice i think that's the range where i would be like you know what i do like a lot of the receivers in this class but here we have a guy that is already a year into the offense we've already seen that he has a good rapport uh with with patrick mahomes that feels like a little too too good a value to pass up despite all the legal issues and, and worries about those kind of things so yeah here's my 202 and i'll take rice but i think once we get into that first round range which i get it for some people there's not a huge difference in this class uh so i can understand that but i i do think that we are around 110 111 that's where we're going to start to see the top tier running backs in this class go and i would hate to miss out on Trey Benson to the Cowboys or uh, Jonathan Brooks to the Chargers or, you know, one of these spots where we're like, oh, yeah, that's sexy. I'd hate to miss out on that. Uh, so I think that that early second is where I would feel pretty comfortable. Flip side, you said you like Hollywood Brown more than some dynasty managers might. 
what would you be willing to give up for dynasty for Hollywood Brown? And I'll say this is sort of a sell high window for some managers with Hollywood Brown. Mm -hmm. They're thinking that the rice news makes him just a little bit more appealing. Now I think that years and years ago, people might've said they're right, but now people have a little bit more knowledge. There's a lot more legal experts putting out stuff on, you know, Twitter and and on some sites like, you know, dynasty nerds and player profiler. Um, so I don't think it's as as cut and dry as years past, but it's certainly you're paying maybe a dollar ten on the dollar. You're paying a little more for Hollywood Brown right now. What would you be willing to give up to get him on your dynasty roster today? Yeah, today I probably wouldn't be trying to buy today, but but in this situation, uh, because I, I would like to wait until that situation clears up. We know exactly what it was, and then I feel like I'm paying paying fair price again. Uh, but but if I'm paying today, uh it would probably be a mid second. So 206, 207, something like that, where we kind of get into the range. Uh, at least this is my mentality when I'm drafting. When I get to the second round and specifically the back half of the second round, the, the floor goes out the window for me. I couldn't care less about a player's floor anymore. I want to know where's the player ceiling. And because so many of these guys are going to miss, so many of them are going to miss. And if a guy hits, but he's a low ceiling guy, well, I didn't really make much on that, but if he's a high ceiling guy and he hits, then I feel fantastic about it. And that's that's kind of how I look at Hollywood Brown right now. Is the floor pretty low on him? Yeah, it's decently low. Uh, it's only a one-year deal, $7 million. That's not a lot of money for a receiver that is supposed to be in his prime. But if he hits, oh my goodness, all of a sudden the value skyrockets. So I think that mid-second range is is what I'd be looking to pay. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. And I think it, you just have to simply look back at the Calvin Ridley situation where sometimes these guys do bounce back and get a, a really lofty payday. If Hollywood Brown has 12 touchdown catches and 135 targets next year in Kansas City, uh, he certainly helps us in, in fantasy and helps your dynasty team. But he also could have a little bit more long-term stability with somebody willing to reward him or Kansas City just simply pays him uh, for what they saw on the field. So uh, definitely an interesting one, a lot to think about with the Rice situation, and Hollywood Brown definitely a very interesting one. But the name of the game here is sell highs, and we're talking about some players that might make you uncomfortable to hear, but we're talking about trying to get you the best possible dynasty roster and sometimes selling high on players, even young, exciting ones, can really result in us supercharging our dynasty rosters. So Garrett, you're the guest. Why don't you share a player that you would be willing to sell high on right now? And in the pre-show we talked, we have one that we sort of agreed on. Yeah, absolutely. We can definitely, I don't know if you want to get to him now, or if you want to wait on it. Whenever you uh, want, you can save it. You can keep it in the back pocket, however you want to do it. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll save it. Uh, but actually, I'm going to go to the guy that's directly behind him on keep trade cut right now. And, uh, you know, we have our own ADP at dynasty nerds, but I know this is kind of the universal, uh, go-to for ADP. And I'm looking at James cook as a guy that I would be looking to sell. Uh, and particularly right now in this window, uh, the reason being <clears throat> he's coming off his, his best year yet. So always, you know, when, when somebody's at their peak value, that's a good time to look at potentially selling. He's now being listed as running back 11 uh, on keep trade cut, which is pretty high, uh, pretty pretty good value there uh, on James Cook. Only 24 and a half years old. So I've, I've kind of given you all the things that you're like, oh yeah, this sounds like a guy that that I want on my dynasty roster, right? Why, why are we selling? Well, here's the problem. James Cook is a, a very inconsistent player. And I struggle with players that are really inconsistent on my dynasty rosters. Best ball? Completely different story. We can we can be inconsistent and, and and we can be totally fine. But consistency really does matter. I need to know when I can start you and when I can start you with confidence uh, versus trying to make some lineup decisions. Two, we are just two weeks away from the NFL draft. And the way that I look at the running back position, basically everybody outside of the top eight or nine guys at the running back position are all susceptible to having someone drafted to their team and tanking their value. And I think the the Buffalo Bills are somebody that we've looked at as a possible team to take that running back for a while. James Cook was a guy that they took in the late second, 
but still, once again, late in games, they don't have that guy to grind the clock. We have some big physical running backs that are expected to go on day two, day three, and early round four that could all hop in here and take touches away from James Cook. So while I don't think his value is going to necessarily crater, I don't see a scenario where he surpasses the RB11 mark in value where he's at currently. And it's very, there's a couple, I, I love that you said James Cook, and he's a guy that I certainly have a decent amount of in Dynasty right now. And I don't know if this is necessarily like, a, hey, I got to get out of James Cook, but there is some fear and trepidation. But in terms of Dynasty, like game theory, this is the probably the only time in James Cook's career where you could make an argument that if I was going to ask anybody on the street, who's going to score the most point PPR fantasy points for the Buffalo Bills next year, besides, of course, the quarterback, Josh Allen, you're going to get a lot of answers that James Cook is the is the guy in Buffalo. Sure. You're going to get a couple Kincaid people, but the the lack of wide receivers, there's a nightmare scenario during the draft that the, the Bills, let's say they trade up and draft a Xavier Worthy, and then let's say a couple rounds later, they draft a Marshawn Lloyd in the third round and just say, we want a really good backup and somebody that we can lean on. The one thing about James Cook that's interesting is we saw the fumbles and then we've also seen a lot of sort of letdown plays where anybody who's, you know, had him in, in fantasy, there's sort of the near touchdown, sort of the missed big play opportunities. They seem to occur with him. And the other thing I'll ask for you, a tape grinder, Garrett, did you ever consider when evaluating James Cook, the prospect, and this is not a guy that was a, was some sort of scrub. It was a Georgia running back drafted yeah. in the third, the third round, third round or second round. I'm drawing a blank. I think third he was round, at correct? the very end of the second. Very second, end of the okay, second, so very end of a second. surprise. Yep. Very end of the second to Buffalo. Okay. In the in the Travis Etienne class, the Najee Harris class. Um, did we ever anticipate a, a time where James Cook would be more valuable than any running back in a current draft class? Because I think that's just kind of fundamentally like James Cook is worth more than any running back in this draft class. That seems sort of flawed. Because I think Jonathan Brooks, we could agree. I think we could agree that Trey Benson are both better prospects at this point in the process than James Cook w Cook was. And you could probably come up with a couple other running backs you might have liked better profile-wise than James Cook when he was entering the league. Yeah, as far as my, my score, so this is just my tape score, independent of everything else, just purely tape, uh, I would have four guys that were ahead of James Cook, uh, his prospect score versus their prospect score. So I would have four guys ahead of him in this specific class. So yeah, it is it is a really odd phenomena that he is doing as well and, and, and valued as highly as he is. So this is no next knock against James Cook. Uh, I've just always been hesitant to really think about him as a much more than a PPR receiving running back. And until he proves it, and I we've seen it in individual games at times, we're like, oh man, James Cook's this is his game today. He's cooking. Uh, and then you have have the following week where you're like, oh, never mind. Uh, so that that's always been the thing for me. Uh, and they the Bills keep saying this. It's tough to believe until they actually make it happen. But every year you hear, we want him to run less. And, you know, where are you taking a lot of big hits and stuff? You're taking a big, big hits in the red zone because guys are extending the ball over and they're getting hit in the ribs. And, you know, there's different things like that. You would think that they would want a... Braylon Allen, a Marshawn Lloyd, a Trey Benson, a a guy that fits that more prototypical, you know, physical goal line type of guy uh, to to take some of the wear and tear off of Josh Allen. But we'll see. You know, actions speak louder than words, and so far the actions haven't necessarily followed it up. So my guy, this is going to be the lowest ranked guy that uh, I'm going to be discussing today. But Deontay Johnson, it's sort of a sell high window if I've ever seen one. The sort of the enthusiasm has come back for Deontay Johnson. There's a lot of like sharp people out there saying, you know, Deontay's a, a dark horse for 150 targets this year. Get back to his target volume that we have seen in three seasons in his career. He gave us a ton of targets. So, you know, hat tip to Deontay on that. But I just look at the Pittsburgh Steelers organization and they don't seem to miss when it comes to 
moving on from skill position players. I'll throw a couple names out there. Le'Veon Bell, Juju Smith-Schuster, Antonio Brown, Chase Claypool. When Pittsburgh moves on from someone, they never get burned. And I think that at the end of the day, Deontay Johnson might be letting people down a lot. Um, certainly wide receiver 40 is not a price point that's going to kind of destroy you. But I do think that his valuation varies league to league. There are certain managers that are going to look at Deontay Johnson and be willing to pay you a lot more than that wide receiver 40 price tag. And like you said, Garrett, this is a very talented wide receiver class in this draft. There's a couple of players that are going to be absolutely in play for Carolina with those two early second round picks. A year from now, I think one of those players could be worth more than Deontay Johnson. I think this is a perfect sell high window right before the NFL draft. No, I, I think that's a really interesting call on that because I am a guy that that likes Deontay Johnson uh, as a player. I, you know, I, I could see him having a big year, but you're absolutely right. All of this stuff before the NFL draft, if they're not somebody that you have supreme confidence has their 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 role, their situation locked in, it, there's a lot of risk involved. There's a lot of risk involved, and so any time that you can get rid of some of that risk and you can secure yourself into positions, even if it's a seemingly lateral move, but for a guy that's a, a much more secure and locked in you know maybe it would be a guy that's you know just a couple spots ahead a terry mclaurin you know terry mclaurin seems to have his spot locked in secured we know what we're getting out of terry mclaurin there's not a huge age difference less than a year difference between the two guys so you know maybe that's a pivot so that way you're not taking on as much risk with deontay johnson uh as, as you would or or less risk with with uh McLaurin, as as you would compared to Deontay Johnson. Back to you, Garrett. Give us another sell high candidate. Yeah. So this one, this one feels a little spicy. Uh, this one feels a little spicy, and and I know we're gonna get some negative comments uh, on this. We haven't even seen this guy yet, and you're already selling him. This is ridiculous. I don't get Brian Thomas Jr. I don't. I know that people love Brian Thomas Jr. and sharp people, people that I respect that know their stuff like Brian Thomas Jr. And so uh, I hesitate to do this one, but here's my, here's my thought process. I think he is not in the tier with the top three guys. Uh, I know draft capital wise, it seems like on a lot of mocks, he's kind of pushing towards those guys. We're seeing Brian Thomas taking in, the mid teens a lot in these, these uh, mock drafts. And so he's kind of pushing up value wise currently <clears throat> wide receiver 29 uh, on keep trade cut. So ahead of a guy like rice, just behind a guy like Jaden Reed and Debo Samuel. So a, a really valuable range as far as wide receivers go. Here's, here's the problem that I have with, with Brian Thomas. He currently projects a little bit more of a project more than a solidified player. When we look at his profile, he's a guy that hasn't played a ton of football. Uh, you know, I think it was his junior year that he really focused on football because uh, he was more of a basketball guy before that. So hasn't played a ton of football. Uh, he, as a route runner, is very unrefined at this point. He really just ran a lot of go routes, a lot of slants, and a lot of comebacks. That was mostly his profile. So he has a lot of work to do still as developing as a route runner. And in today's game, if you profile as a speed, deep threat, Z type of receiver, it's really tough to have any sort of consistent production in a league that plays a lot of two safety looks. You might get a few plays a game, but that's really tough to count on. My guess is his value next year will be much lower than his his value is now. So if you are a guy that is a Brian Thomas guy, I would wait a year, then take the dip and expect him to improve upon his game and develop more. 
because I think the value for him will be less expensive next year than it is this year. Now, I'm not a big Brian Thomas guy, so I probably won't be getting in either way. Uh, but that's my concern overall with Brian Thomas Jr. I know it's spicy, and I know that there, there's going to be truthers that are going to come after me, uh, but that's where, that's where I'm at with Brian Thomas Jr. Yeah, so I have him wide receiver four in the class, and I think I'm taking a little bit more of an optimistic approach, but I do agree with you that people are treating him like the draft capital is there, and also the role. Simply being drafted inside of the top 20 doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to fall into line where he's like the number two target on a team out the gate. Teams trade up. Teams want talented wide receiver threes. Uh, I brought up like Miami and Philadelphia as nightmare scenarios. I think they could be in the mix for a wide receiver due to the quality of the class. If he lands in either of those situations, you're not nearly as happy as like an Arizona trade trades down and just takes Brian Thomas. And I'll say Cody Carpentier is also down on Brian Thomas relative to some other wide receivers in the class. So you're not alone. There's some tape grinders sort of poking holes in what Brian Thomas is. I've also heard Scott Barrett um, have a little bit of trepidation on him. He brought up the fact that he didn't break out early, this sort of back line. And again, it's a junior year, so it's not a senior year, uh, you know, Xavier Leggett uh, situation um, or like a Kim, Kim, Kim Butler situation. But you want to see it a little bit earlier. Interesting guy to bring up. I'll go even spicier, and people are going to be Ooh. booing this podcast right now. And this is a guy that I love. I love this player. But I look at a situation where, and I'll just go ahead and say it, A.J. Brown. A.J. Brown has now had two seasons in a row where he has been dominant in fantasy. He's given us two top eight seasons in a row where the guy has just been unbelievable. He's beat his ADP expectations two years in a row. He's been a dynasty steal for two seasons in a row. Now we get the offensive coordinator change. And people are looking at this as a largely positive thing for A.J. Brown. And when it when it happened, I sort of took the same approach. Kellen Moore is going to have Jalen, uh, Jalen Hurts you know, under center more. He's going to take more shots downfield. They're going to have a little more trickeration in their play calls. It's going to be less boring than we saw last year in Philly. And A.J. Brown is going to thrive. But then I look more into it, and I see the presence of Devonta Smith, also the signing of Saquon Barkley, and also the fact that I think Philly might draft a wide receiver at the end of the first round. I think that there's a chance a year from now that A.J. that AJ Brown is worth less than simply – I'll throw out some guys on keep trade cut. He's got Malik Neighbors behind him. I would take Malik Neighbors – all day for A.J. Brown right now, despite my love of A.J. Brown. Then you have a few other younger wide receivers like Roma Dunze, like Drake London, that could take a huge step forward and be five years younger than A.J. Brown with similar 2025 pros- uh, prospects for their, their projections. I think Devonta Smith has become so beat up that he might be a little bit more of a buy. And I think A.J. Brown heading into his 27-year-old year I think that he's not going to be worth more in Dynasty right now in a year. I think this might be an opportunity to pivot. I think he's a perfect trade-up type guy or a trade-down and get a a package type guy. And that hurts me to say. I'm still going to be drafting the heck out of him in best balls and redrafts. But, hey, it's uh, father time is, is undefeated, and these guys do start to lose a little value. Not every wide receiver is Devontae Adams and just keeps doing it you know, well into the, to their, their early thirties. So that one makes me a little uncomfortable, Garrett, your thoughts. No, I, I don't hate it at all. When you look at all of the guys in the top 16, 17 right now, outside of Tyree kill, which we know is he's just kind of a freak outside of that. AJ Brown is the oldest guy. And that says a little bit about the dynasty community in general. We, we tend to move on a little quicker uh, with some of these players and and we, we appreciate the youth, but at the end of the day, the market is what the market is, whether, whether you think that's correct or not, that's what the market's saying he's worth. And so if a guy that is kind of nearing that, what we would consider older wide receiver age, even though he's really not that old, but if he's nearing that older wide receiver age, What's the community going to do? They're going to continually push them down for these younger guys that are 
in the year two, in year three that are more exciting and more upside and more, you know, all of these types of narratives that is just going to continually push his value down and down and down, whether it's correct or incorrect. And, you know, maybe at some point then he flips and becomes a buy because we push him down so far. But right now you're right. I don't see a scenario where, you know, he's at wide receiver eight. Do I think he's going to be higher than that next year? Probably not. And probably not the year after either. So uh, I think it makes perfect sense. Definitely makes me a little sad to say that one. All right. Uh, lay, lay us, uh, lay one on us, Garrett. The people are, are ready to be punched in the gut one more time. <laughs> Man, uh, let's, uh, let, let's go with this guy here. It's another one where I'm going back to the running back position here. And he's not far away from the James Cook range. Uh, in fact, two spots below him and keep trade cut. And that's Isaiah Pacheco. Uh, Isaiah Pacheco, 25 years old, uh, a guy that was a seventh round pick by the Chiefs just a few years ago. He, here's the thing with, with Isaiah Pacheco. We have not seen his role evolve in his time with Kansas City so far. And while he is a great between the tackles grinder, he's not somebody that has any real chance of putting up elite fantasy football numbers. So when we look at, you know, this past year, which he had a really good year, he had a really good year overall in PPR leagues. He was, let me grab it real quick. He was, he was running back 15, you know, 15 points a game, solid running back, but even in that, still very inconsistent. Nine, eight, uh, two sixes. Like it, it, it can be a bit of a roller coaster with him. He's really a guy that is a bit touchdown dependent to really get into that, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20 point range. You really need for him to get a touchdown. And in this Patrick Mahomes offense, that's not something that's guaranteed. They're going to throw the ball around a little bit. And I know they're running it more than they ever have. But once again, this is another team where I'm not removing them from the possibility of drafting a running back. They don't have a lot invested in this guy. They don't seem like a team with where all of their money is right now that is going to want to pay a running back good money. And so I don't know that he's going to get an amazing second contract with this, this Kansas City Chiefs team. And they could honestly use somebody that is a little more interchangeable. Think of a Jalen Wright or somebody like that in the backfield where a little bit more dynamic, can do a little more in the receiving game. So it it feels like a situation right now. He He's ranked higher than he's ever actually scored uh, on the season. And I'm just, I'm concerned that he's a kind of a, Rich Dodson says it all the time, hashtag two to three year window guy. And we've, we've hit his window. I love that one. And that's the guy that I actually sold in a in a league. He's a perfect package type guy if you're trying to level up. If you're trying to trade up from a pick, throw Pacheco in there, and it maybe gets you from a non-elite tier into an elite tier. He's got enough of a ceiling case for dynasty managers that look at him and say, this is the Kansas City Chiefs running back. And he just played really, really well in year two. But you hit on a couple of things there. They're not paying him anything. He was a seventh round pick. They don't have anything massively invested in him. And his profile is not a guy who's going to catch a lot of passes. I'd say he actually exceeded expectations last year as a pass catcher when you compare what he did in his rookie season to a year two. Now, the bull case is the team trusted him more and wanted to get him targets. But the bear case is Jarek McKinnon was banged up. If Jeremy McKinnon is is not is not banged up last year and certainly didn't you know show little signs of regression, then you have a similar situation to Pacheco year one and it's more of a split. I think the Kansas City Chiefs offense is at its best when you have a McKinnon type. This year's draft has a number of guys who can catch passes, and then you've got some guys that I just think are again the James Cook argument that were clearly better prospects than Pacheco was two years ago. He's a guy that's getting propped up by a situation, a great situation. But yeah, I'm I'm with you on that one. And I'll I'll stay at the running back position. This is a guy we agreed on uh pre-show, and that's Ken Walker. And our friends at Keep Trade Cut 
have Ken Walker at running back 10. His seasons in his first year and second year were somewhat similar. He scored a lot of rushing touchdowns. Uh, This is a guy that when you watch him play, you want to really love Ken Walker because he breaks off long runs. He's exciting. But there's a few red flags here. We see an offensive coordinator change. We go to Ryan Grubb, who's a guy that I'm really excited about. I think it's a an inspired choice. It's sort of a Mike, Mike McDonald hiring a Mike McDonald of offense, a guy who's a great college offensive coordinator. Um, why is why why do we see uh you know DeBoer at, at Alabama right now? Ryan Grubb is one of the main reasons. This guy crushed it at Washington, and this is a guy that also crushed it at Fresno State. Known for passing the football. Zach Charbonnet, a better pass catcher than Ken Walker, had a lot more receptions in college than Walker. Um, and I think Zach Charbonnet is sort of a thorn in the side and also the chance of a regression on rushing touchdowns. Now, Ken Walker could burn us here because the quality of the offense could could be better and he could have more opportunities to score touchdowns. But besides the touchdown scoring, I don't see a situation where he's going to be well, let's put it like this. I don't see Ken Walker as RB10 a year from now. I think this might be peak value time for him and a, and a window where you're simply selling at his peak value. Yeah, we we totally agreed on this one. This was one that we both kind of had coming into this as somebody that just feels a little overpriced for the moment. And when you consider, I, I think one of the biggest things is the offensive coordinator change. When you consider going from one of the most run centric offenses in the NFL to one that we project to be on the lower end side as far as rushing attempts goes that alone can move a guy two three four five spots down a list uh according to what they would have been able to do had they got the same type of volume but then you you also just run the risk of what if what if they like Charbonnet just as much if not more I don't necessarily, but you never know how these new staffs are going to come in and want to run their team. So there's just too many things that I think he would have to overcome to be able to continue to improve upon what he's done. And last part of it is he's 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 been banged up every season so far. I know it's only two years, uh, but he hasn't been the pinnacle of health. Uh, so So that always leaves me with a little bit of trepidation as well. Yeah, I I think it's one of those ones where you could get burned, but probably not if you're going to get running back 10 value. I think he's also the kind of guy that I can offer Ken Walker to for an older running back that I have less concerns about this year. Like simply Mm -hmm. put, if I look at keep trade cut, you know, the to get a Ken Walk, I could get Josh Jacobs plus from some dynasty managers for Ken Walker. I feel better about Josh Jacobs this coming season in his role and the Absolutely. offense, just a little bit older. And that's the only reason he's, he's, uh, he's, uh, a little, a little less expensive. Um, we'll kick it back to you. Give us, uh, give us somebody that, that, uh, you want to ha- talk about as a sell high. Yeah. My last one here, uh, this is my last one and we're, we're heading over to the quarterback position and I, I struggle with this one a little bit, not because I think, He's not a good sell high. I do think he's a good sell high. But you see the flashes of upside, and you're like, oh, there could be something here. But I think that's also why he would make a very good sell high. Uh, And so the guy for me, currently quarterback 24 on keep trade cut, and that's Will Levis. So we're, we're down a little bit. We're not quite as high as some of the running backs that we talked about. But Will Levis right now, he he had a he had a solid rookie campaign. But most of that is really based off of that first game. That first game, he absolutely balled out. Him and Nuke were going nuts. And then the rest of the season was just kind of fine. I feel like right now at the quarterback 24 spot, when you look at most of the guys ahead of him and right in his range, they're kind of in that safe quarterback. We know their job. We know their role. I don't think he's that guy. I don't think his job is safe like it is with Matthew Stafford, who's a little bit older, or Baker Mayfield, or Deshaun Watson. Like, I don't think he is a safe quarterback. He's has a limited history with the Titans, and we have a head coaching change. Head coaching changes typically mean that they want their guy. 
So I think that means this is going to be a short rope for Will Levis. He either balls out this year and becomes their franchise quarterback, but if he's mediocre or worse, they could easily move on. And if I'm going to put it on a tinfoil hat, and I might in this moment, if I'm going to put on a tinfoil hat, the Titans are at seven in this draft. There's nothing saying that they couldn't decide, you know what? Maybe we want one of these guys, and they are a dark horse candidate to come up and take one of these top four guys that people are really excited about. Do I think that's going to happen? No. I think they're going to go offensive line at seven and secure that O-line, but I'm not ruling it out. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. So uh, Will Levis right now, in a range of quarterbacks that I feel are much more safe, Will Levis just feels very risky. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think that just fundamentally, he has gained value because of a coaching change, and he's gained value because of a kind of a couple of veteran, uh, you know, free agent signings. Like nobody's like standing on their head about Calvin Ridley or Tony Pollard in Dynasty, but we see these guys as stylistic changes in Tennessee that Will Levis is going to benefit from. I would like to have some Will Levis in Dynasty, but I agree that if somebody's willing to treat him like a premium asset and I can pivot and get somebody that I like better in this draft, guy was a second round pick in the NFL draft. And like you said, very minimal in terms of dynasty success. I mean, excuse me, like sort of fantasy success scoring wise. People think about that first game, but there was a lot of like below purgatory level games uh, throughout that season uh, last year. So Will Levis, you know, a guy that they're setting him up for success but that success doesn't always happen. I'll, I'll stay with a kind of another uncomfortable name, and I'm going to go with the wide receiver 10 on keep trade cut, and it's a guy that I have a good amount of, and that's Chris Olave. And I sort of overshot, and at the beginning of the process, I was trying to trade Chris Olave for picks that would get me Malik Neighbors and picks that would get me a Roma Dunze. Maybe I shot a little too highly, and I sort of sort of should have approach those trades differently because I think the market quickly changed on neighbors uh, Olave. Now you're getting a, a rejection and the Adunze market versus Olave, I think is getting there. Chris Olave has played really, really well for two straight years. But like you said, with Pacheco, he's being ranked higher than we've ever seen him finish. Last year, he finishes wide receiver 16 overall metrics wise he had plenty of opportunities to get to that you know top 10 top 8 season the target competition was not strong his you know target percentage was high the air yards are there and it's sort of a just a little bit of a disappointment especially where you drafted him in in redraft and certainly took him in the dynasty startup so for me chris olave is just one of these guys is he one of these brandon ayuk types that's just going to give you these high end wide receiver two seasons and not really ever give us that top five wide receiver season that we really saw hope for in our valuations. I think that could be the case. I think he's a really good player attached to a quarterback who's not very good. And we've seen it now for two straight seasons where the guy's gotten what we needed in terms of scoring and just hasn't delivered. I think we could have another season where he's like wide receiver 15. And at the end of the day, that wide receiver 10 price tag I mean, you talk about the wide receivers in this class, Garrett. Next year's class is pretty good, too. He could see himself slide behind a couple of those, you know, burden types that are coming up in 2025 as well. Yeah, no, I think that's very fair overall. He has been a a, a little bit of a disappointment uh, since his since it's, it's coming out of Ohio State. And I know that rookie season that there was a lot of excitement and a lot of buzz. But you're right. He hasn't really capitalized on it. And for me, I'm not anti Chris Olave at all. If I have him, I'm cool with it. But really, it's more just looking at some players that are directly behind, like Drake London. I would 10 out of 10 times rather have Drake London uh, than I would Chris Olave. Uh, and, and Romo Dunze, I think I'm in the same ballpark with him. So uh, there are a couple guys, even, even Michael Pittman. Uh, I'm higher on Michael Pittman Jr. than other people might be. So there's some guys directly behind him that I like just as much, if not more. So it's not necessarily I think he's bad or uh, not going to produce in the future. I think he will. I just think he's a little overpriced. Yeah, I agree on that. I think overpriced nailed it. And I actually took Drake London <laughs> ahead of him 
in a dynasty startup, a recent one, and it just felt correct. I have Kirk Cousins in an offense where I've seen Kirk Cousins elevate all these receivers. And besides Devontae Adams, we don't really have anything to kind of hang our hat on when it comes to Derek Carr. We saw the Darren Waller years. Hunter Renfro is a little, you know, that's a little different kind of player than Chris Olave. So uh, my last sell high, it's a very uncomfortable one. And it's one that I think deservedly is a top four tight end in Dynasty right now. But Trey McBride is being valued as tight end two overall. And you're seeing him go extremely highly off the board in Dynasty startups. People are treating him like he is the next Travis Kelsey. The draft capital is strong. The production we saw last year was incredible. He succeeded with three separate quarterbacks last year. And he had a really, really strong production in a limited sample size. We both talked about Marvin Harrison and his impact on the offense. Arizona's offense could look a lot different next year. And Trey McBride might be in a situation where if he's the tight end two in Dynasty right now, will he be there a year from now? I don't think so. I think that at the end of the day, if somebody's willing to overpay me Trey McBride, and I think right now I could get Mark Andrews plus for Trey McBride. And again, I'm giving up some years, but Mark Andrews, we've seen a tight end one finish. Uh, The guy's an incredible talent, and I know what his role is going to be next year. McBride, I think I know what his role is going to be, but there could be some variables. Your thoughts on trading a guy that everybody loves right now in Trey McBride? Yeah, I... I, th- I think that's a great call. And you look at that offense last year, who, who else were they going to throw the football to? I mean, realistically, who were they going to throw the football to? There weren't a lot of other options. We Greg fully George. expect <laughs> we, we, we fully expect them to take a Marvin Harrison Jr., a Romo Dunze, uh, a, a Malik Neighbors, or maybe they do trade down and they take Brian Thomas or Adonai Mitchell or whoever. But they're going to – I would be shocked if they leave the first round without a wide receiver. So with that, I, I think that now he bumps to probably number two in the pecking order long term. And just looking at some of the tight ends behind him, I feel similarly or better about most of the guys that are directly behind him. Brock Bowers is up in the air for me. Uh, I, I struggle with a rookie tight end without knowing where he's going. That one is tough for me, but when I look at Kyle Pitts, I'd rather have Pitts. When I look at Kincaid, I'd rather have Kincaid. When I look at Hawkinson, I'd rather have Hawkinson. I get the injury, but we just saw him as tight end one this past season. He's only going to miss some time. He's not going to miss the whole season, so I'd rather TJ Hawkinson. And Mark Andrews, I'm pretty parallel uh, to, to McBride with. So once again, it's another situation where not a bad player. I don't think he's going to completely fall off the map. I think he's going to be a top six tight end for a while. But if I can get another guy that I feel just as good or better about and even get a little bit plus on top, maybe I really like that. Yeah, it's definitely an uncomfortable one, but I think you nailed it. You're going to get those guys plus right now, especially in tight end premium scoring, because the allure of a tight end that could give us 140 targets, there's only a handful of them. And Trey McBride is one. I'll, I'll give it to him. He could be one of those guys. But at the end of the day, Marvin Harrison Jr. could totally blow that up. He might go from uh, 135 targets down to you know 120 cap ceiling. That makes a difference. I think it's worth kicking the tires to see if you can get those guys. And I'll bring up Hawkinson. If we were doing a buy lows, I think we'd both be on Hawkinson because all day. TJ Hawkinson's like tight end seven in some of these dynasty startups. He's got the contract insulation. You've got the fact that there's no quarterback clarity in Minnesota and he's injured. It's a perfect storm for going out and getting yourself some TJ Hawkinson. But Garrett, this was an absolute blast. Let everybody know where they can find your work and what you've got coming out before the NFL draft. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to keep grinding all of that tape. Uh, I'm going to be looking at all of these prospects, trying to find diamonds in the rough and guys that we like and, and poking holes here and there. So it's a fun time of year. So you can find me on Twitter at Dynasty Price. Uh, talking all things Dynasty all the time. You can find me on the Dynasty Nerds podcast uh, and all over our YouTube page as well. Yeah, highly recommend checking out Garrett's work and the fine work they do over at Dynasty Nerds. Stick with us here at Dynasty Life. I'm going to have Ryan McDowell on next week. I'm going to try to squeeze on a few extra shows 
uh, right before the NFL draft. We want to get you ready to crush your dynasty leagues and crush your rookie drafts. We'll talk to you soon. Hey, I want to thank you for being part of this broadcast. If you have any thoughts on it, leave a comment. If you enjoyed it, make sure you leave a like. And if you want to see more shows on the Player Profiler channel, subscribe to it. That's how we know you want more.